Welcome to Hope City Online. It's so good to see you today, and we hope you're going to be blessed by the message today. If you do enjoy our sermons, then why don't you press the subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss out on any one of our sermons. We upload them every single week. And if you want to give to us today, there is a link to donate in the description. Otherwise, we hope you enjoy the message. So welcome today, Andrew. It's so great to have you with us. Thank you for having me, Andrew. This is a real honor for me to be with you. Yes, it's so exciting that we can do that. And so, Andrew, we're just going to open it up to you now just to share the word. And we know that God's placed something on your heart. And we're just ready right now to receive all that God has. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, we were talking right before this broadcast started that I think it's been at least seven years since I was there with you. But I still remember that service. I don't remember what I ministered. But I remember the church. Well, I and I, you know, I, and, go yes, ahead. Sorry, Andrew. I, I remember that too, and I remember that you came up to me before the service, and you uh, I, I, you asked me what to what did I want you to share on, and and I think I said you uh, staying full of God, and so I was amazed that you just walked out there with your Bible and you did three sessions, and it was just incredible the teaching that you had. Well, I remember being with you, and and you know, I hadn't had the pleasure of hearing you minister, but like I've often said, I, I can tell more about a minister by seeing the fruit that they produce than anything else. And I was very impressed with the church. I mean, people loved God and I was sharing about the things of God. And you know, sometimes uh, when I go places, the people aren't very receptive. And uh, so, but some, sometimes it's hard to minister, but in your place, man, it was like they were just drawing it out of me. and so. I still remember that, and that was just wonderful. Thanks. So uh, it's it's a blessing for me to be with you, Andrew, and I appreciate your ministry and appreciate what you're doing there. That's a real blessing. Thank you. So, so let me say that um, you know before I get in right into what the Lord put on my heart, let me say to you that uh, Andrew said that the church has been going good, that people have been watching online, and people have been giving. But I just want to encourage you, you know that this is a hard time on everybody, but I think Satan would love to use this to divide the body of Christ, to separate us. And even though we have this ability to Zoom and to still see each other, you know, the scripture says we don't need to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It is really important that you come together as a body. And there's some things that just cannot be taught. They have to be caught. It's in relationship with people. So. I want to encourage you, don't get lazy just because we can stay at home and, and still you know, go to church in your pajamas. <laughs> and you need to continue uh, supporting the church financially and also as soon as you can, come back together because it's really important. We need each other. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. What I want to share with you is uh, when I first really got turned on to the Lord, uh, I think that most people are something similar to this, that I had a zeal for God. I believe that God could do anything. When I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, March the 23rd, 1968, I, meet, I was raised in a church that didn't believe in miracles, didn't believe in healing. They believed those things could happen, but they certainly didn't believe that you could get a handle on it and that you could grab hold of a promise from God and make it come to pass in your life. And so uh, I, I wasn't taught to really believe for these things. But once I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I don't know, somehow I think it was the Holy Spirit just revealed to me that God was still the same today as he's ever been, that miracles are for us today, that I needed to expect a supernatural life. I've often said it this way, that if you were alive if your Christian life isn't supernatural, then it's superficial because God wants to do supernatural things through you. So anyway, I, I just intuitively knew this and I started believing for things. I started believing for healing. I started praying for people and things. I started believing for, uh, you know, uh, financial provision. And I started believing that God wanted me to do something more than just warm up you. And there was all kinds of things. So I believed that God could do anything, but I was confused on what my part was and what God's part was. 
And I know that there's probably people watching this right now that you don't doubt that God does miracles. Like I've been blessed, and I'm not going to take the time to just give you all these testimonies, but I've seen multiple people raised from the dead, including my own son who was dead for nearly five hours and came back to life. I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. Most of you would say, well, I believe that, but how do you how do you get that manifest in your life? Do you just wait on God, and is it up to God whether food in your life and what you see, or is there something you can do? And I think that most people go to an extreme in this situation, and they do one or the other. They either sit there and they just tell God their situation, and then they ask, oh God, if it's your will, move in my life. And they just sit there passively waiting on God to move. Or the other extreme is they take all of the burden of producing whatever it is that you're believing for upon themselves, and they just get in there to where they're confessing the word, they're praying, they're going to church, they're paying their tithe, they're doing all of these things, and they think that somehow or another that will make God move. So which is it? And I believe that I can effectively say it's neither. It's a combination of the two. And here's a scripture that the Lord used to help revealing these, reveal these things to me. And if you can understand this, I believe this will really, really help you. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, let me tell you what this verse does not say. It does not say that you're saved by grace. And it doesn't say that you're saved by faith. Now, often you'll hear people talk about that, that it's just the grace of God that saved us. And that's not incorrect if you just are emphasizing that it wasn't you that saved yourself. It was the grace of God. Matter of fact, in context, if you back up to the, uh, I think it's the fifth verse of this same chapter, it's the same context. It says in verse uh, five, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Christ. And then in parentheses, it says, by grace, you're saved. So it's not totally wrong to say that you're saved by grace or that you're saved by faith. But according to Ephesians 2.8, you're saved by grace through faith. It's the combination of the two. And see, this is what I was trying to describe just a moment ago. There's some people that it's just all the grace of God. It's just up to God. It doesn't matter what you do. You can't earn the blessing of God. And that is a true statement, but that leads them into being just passive. And they just sit there and they're waiting on God. And if something happens, well, then praise God. But if it doesn't happen, it must not be God's will. They don't understand the authority and the power that God has given us. But then on the other hand, there are some people that do understand that we have something to do with the power of God. Like the scripture says, John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus came to give us an abundant life. But I think if you just, you know, be honest, you can either look at your life or certainly look around at some of the brothers and sisters that you know in the Lord. And not everybody is experiencing abundant life. The scripture says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, that by his stripes we were healed. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, that Jesus went was anointed with power and with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. I believe that God wants every one of us to be well. He wants us to prosper. He wants us to have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Jesus said the night before his crucifixion, John chapter 16, verse 33, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, is love, joy, and peace. I could just go on with all of the things. But see, God wants us to have this abundant life. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4 says that Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, not just the world to come. Not just eternity. In eternity, we will we'll experience victory. But he gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil world. So based on all these things I'm saying, I believe that God wants us to live an abundant life now. And uh, you've you got to understand what is God's part and what is your part. 
So here's what I'm saying through this verse. God's part is grace. God by grace moves, but then faith reaches out and appropriates what God has already provided. And you've got to have both of these things. If you're just talking about it's totally up to God, it's only by the grace of God that I'm healed or anything, and so it's just up to God, and you aren't going to do anything by faith, well, then you won't see the full manifestation. And let me just prove that to you through a verse. I'm going to quote this over in Titus chapter 2, verse 11. And that verse says, The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men. And then it goes on to say, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly and righteously in this present world. But Titus 2.11 says the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. Now, if it was just grace alone that saves you, then every person would be saved because it says the grace of God has come to all men. But see, Ephesians 2.6, you're saved by grace. That's God's part. Through faith, that's your part. You can't save yourself, but God won't save you without you receiving and putting faith in what he's done. Boy, that is a huge statement right there. And then on the other side of this coin, uh, look in Mark chapter 11, verse 24. It says, uh, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, people have taken that verse that says you've got to believe that you receive when you pray. And if you put that together with the 23rd verse, that was talking about how important it is to speak forth your faith. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. So that right there shows you that you have authority. Notice it, it, it did not say that whoever will ask God to cast this mountain into the sea will see it come to pass. No, you have to speak to your problem. If your problem is sickness, you have to speak to sickness. If your problem is poverty, you have to speak to poverty. You have to speak to whatever the problem is, not talk to God about it. And see, this is where most Christians will go to God. No, God, the doctor said this. The banker said this. My husband or wife said this. And we will talk about our problem and then ask God to do something. He told you to speak to that problem. So that's implying that you have the power to do something about it. The average Christian comes to the Lord and they basically are saying something like, Oh, God, I have nothing. I can do nothing. I am just totally powerless to change this situation. Would you please move? Did you know most people would think that that's kind of a good prayer? But, but really, it's denying what God has done on the inside of you. God has given you supernatural ability. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, the Lord was sending out his disciples, and he says, I, in verse 1, he says, I give you power oh, and authority over all of the force of the enemy, over all demons and over all sickness. And then in verse 8, he says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. He did not tell you to pray for the sick. He told you to heal the sick. That's totally different. Now, part of your healing the sick may be that you speak and pray, but I'm saying that he didn't tell you to just come and say, God, I'm nothing. I can't do anything. We are powerless against this, but we ask you to move. No, you have authority and you need to heal the sick. Of course, it's not you doing it. It's God's power, but it's in you. The third chapter of the book of Acts Peter and John were going into the temple at the hour of prayer, and they saw a man who had been lame from his mother's womb. And they said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they just reached down and grabbed him by the hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he went walking and leaping and praising God. If you'll go back and study that in Acts chapter 3, they didn't pray a prayer. They never asked God to heal this person. They never said, oh, God, this is beyond us. He's been lame for 38 years. He was born lame. Oh, God, would you touch him? See, that's the way most people pray. 
But that's not what they did, and that's not what God told us to do. He told us to heal the sick. So it, all of these things that I've been saying lead some people to think, well, then it's not up to God. It's just totally up to me. And they take all of the responsibility upon themselves, and they think that they are making God do something. Go back to Mark chapter 11, verse 24. It says, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. You know, I actually knew a woman. I didn't know her personally, but I, I lived in Arlington, Texas. And in that same town, friends of mine knew this woman who had a Bible school and she only had just a few people in it. But anyway, she used Mark chapter 11, verse 24, to say that you can have whatsoever you desire. And so her desire was she wanted Kenneth Copeland to be her husband. It just so happened that Kenneth Copeland was married to Gloria Copeland. And so the way she dealt with that, she cursed Gloria Copeland and commanded her to die and get out of the way. And then she actually had a wedding in her quote unquote Bible school, they had a wedding and they based it on Mark 11, 24. And in the spirit, she married Kenneth Copeland. Now he wasn't there, but she said, you know, in the spirit, God was putting them together. And she claimed that she could have whatsoever she desired. She desired Kenneth Copeland to be her husband. And so she took these scriptures and she was going to make this happen, make God kill Gloria Copeland so that she could marry Kenneth Copeland. Did you know that that's probably been 40 something years ago? It hasn't happened yet. It's not going to happen. And I know that all of you watching this say, well, of course that's wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. But why? Why is it wrong? Doesn't it say Mark 11, 24, you shall have whatsoever you desire. Isn't desiring another mate, somebody else's mate a whatsoever? Why is it that you can't do this? Now, most of us just intuitively know that, no, God wouldn't lead you to kill somebody and then, you know, marry, uh, you know, just so that you could marry this person. You, you feel that, and so you just dismiss it based on your own feelings. But what is your scriptural basis for saying that you can't do things like that? Let me use a different example. Let's say that you take Mark 11, 24, and you say, I'm going to go rob a bank and I'll get a million dollars, and I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that they will not catch me, that I'll get by with it, I will not go to jail. Isn't that whatsoever? Why can't you go rob a bank? Why can't you sit there and just covet somebody's house and say in the name of Jesus, I claim this house and I command these people to get out? Why can't you do things like that? Here's the answer. And this revolutionized my life when I saw this, this is kind of where I was headed at the beginning of this message. I used to think that faith moved God, that faith made God do something. And you'll often hear people say, faith moves God. And again, I understand that sometimes what they mean uh, may not be inaccurate, but technically that's not true. Faith doesn't move God. Faith doesn't make God do anything. And here's what really changed my life. Faith only appropriates what God has already provided by grace. Now, if God hadn't provided it by grace, your faith can't get it. And this is the reason that you can't claim somebody else as your mate, because God didn't provide adultery and murder in the atonement. God did not provide theft in the atonement. God did not provide covetousness in the atonement. So you can't make God do anything. Faith doesn't move God. God's not the one that's stuck. God by grace has anticipated every need that you and I will ever have. And he's already provided anything and everything that you'll ever need. So that's grace, that's God's part. And since it's grace, you know, the most common definition of grace is unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor. And if it's unearned, undeserved, unmerited, then that means your faith, he doesn't respond to you. God isn't responding to your faith. And when you do a certain number of things right, then God will respond and grant your prayer. No, God by grace has already provided forgiveness of sins, healing, prosperity, deliverance, joy, peace, 
Anything you'll ever need is already provided by grace, but it doesn't automatically work because you have to have faith, which is your positive response to what God has already done. Now, if you were trying to use faith over here to gain a positive response from God, that's not true faith. That's what the Bible calls works, legalism. You're doing something to make God move, and that's completely wrong. So faith doesn't move God. Faith just finds out what God has already provided by grace, and then it reaches out and partakes of it. You know, without me taking the time to turn over there, I'll just refer to Genesis chapter one. And in Genesis chapter one, God created the heavens and the earth and he created Adam and Eve on the sixth day. And actually at the very end of the sixth day, on the first part of the sixth day, he created all of the animals. And so it was at the very end of his creation that he created Adam and Eve. Not because Adam and Eve were the least important. Actually, the scripture shows that we were the focus of his creation. He created all of these things for us to richly enjoy is what the scripture says. So we were actually the focus of creation. Why did he create us last instead of creating us first? For one thing, if he would have created Adam and Eve first, did you know that they would have had to tread water for four days until there was dry land to stand on? And then when, when he started creating the trees and the mountains and things like this, they'd have had to been dodging trees. They didn't come up just as seedlings. They were full grown trees that were already bearing fruit. The reason that God created us last is because he had to prepare everything for us. And think about this, when Adam and Eve were created, they didn't go to God and say, God, I'm hungry. I'm believing you for food. God, I'm asking you to create food for me. God knew that they would need food. He created us to have to have food to be able to survive. And so God created all of the fruit, all of the trees, everything that they would ever need was created before they had the need. The supply was there before the need was there. So see, that's grace. But did grace just automatically get this food on the inside of them? No, they had to reach out and by faith, like take a banana, peel it, and then eat it. God provided it, but they could have died of hunger if they would have just been sitting there waiting on God to force feed them or intravenously put this nourishment into them. No, God made the provision, but they had to reach out and take it. It's the same thing with breathe, breathing. You know, we have to breathe. And God knew this, and so Adam and Eve didn't say, oh God, I need to breathe, quick, uh, give me some air. He knew all of this, and so he already provided it. He provided the atmosphere, the food, everything that we would ever need. The temperature was just perfect. Everything was right. God, by grace, provided everything before we even existed. Likewise, in the new creation, God has provided everything you will ever need. You don't need God to move and heal you. You don't need God to give you finances. You don't need God to give you love, joy, and peace. God's already done all of these things. And when you got born again, all of this moved on the inside of you. Scripture says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, that in Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, as Jesus is... So are we in this world. Do you think Jesus is sick? Do you think Jesus is poor? Do you think Jesus is depressed? Do you think Jesus has any need? No. And you are exactly as Jesus is. Not in your physical body and not in your mental and emotional part, but in your spirit, you are identical to Jesus. You've got the raising from the dead power on the inside of you. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19. It's not out there somewhere and you have to pray it down and do something to get God to respond to you. No, faith is just your response to what you believe God has already done. Faith only reaches out and appropriates what God has already provided. If God hadn't provided it, you can't make it happen. So see, there's a balance between grace, what God has done, and faith, what we do.
if you are just sitting here saying, well, it's just totally up to God. I'm just waiting on God. If, if God wants me, you know, I've, I've heard people use this example before that if God wants us to have children, well, then we'll have children, you know, and if he doesn't want us to have children, then we won't have children. And a lot of people just use that. Uh, and if they can't conceive and if they don't have any children, then they take it as well. This is God's will. I tell you, that's not how it works. When God created Adam and Eve, he told us, you be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. God does not just sit there and look at a couple and say, all right, I'm going to grant them a child. No, if you put the physical laws of procreation into effect, you are going to have children unless something is wrong with you. You could have a physical problem or something like that. And if it wasn't that way, if God is the one that just determined that, all right, I want this person to be pregnant and have a child, and I don't want this person to have it. If that's the way that God did it, then I guarantee you he'd never let prostitutes get pregnant. He wouldn't let single moms get pregnant. He wouldn't let people get pregnant who were going to abort their children. But see, there's just laws that God created. God gave us this ability to procreate. And it's not God that's just doing it. He has, he's made the laws. God created our bodies. God gave us all of these systems. And if you put the laws of God into action, you are going to conceive and you will have a child unless there's something wrong. And if there's something wrong, he's provided healing for that. And you can be totally healed of that. But do you see what I'm saying? God has done his part. Before you had a need, God has created everything you will ever need. That's grace. It's already there. When it comes to healing, you don't need to go and say, oh God, the doctor says this, but I have no power. It's cancer. There is no cure for this. Oh God, would you do something? No, God has known exactly what you were going to face. He knew all of the things. He knew anything that the devil could throw at you he knew about it before it ever happened. And he's already placed on the inside of you sufficient power to overcome every sickness and every disease. Again, that's what it says in he, uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. He gave us authority over all sickness, over all disease, and over all demons to cast them out. He heals all of our diseases, Psalms 103. So you already have this raising from the dead power on the inside of you, but it's not going to automatically heal you because God doesn't do everything by grace. By grace, he provides it. He puts this power on the inside of you, but then faith is how you activate it and how you release it. And see, if you get these things out of balance, if you just go to saying, well, man, I don't have any power at all against this sickness, against this poverty, against what's going on. I, I have no ability whatsoever. And so, God, I'm just waiting on you. And then, case Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. You just figure it's the grace of God. You are going to miss out on a lot of the good things that God has for you because God, by grace, provides it. But you have to use your faith to release it and to manifest what God has done. But on the other hand, if you go on the other side and you get to where, all right, so I've got authority and power, therefore I've got to make these things happen. And you think that somehow or another you are forcing God. It's your faith. Like I've actually had people come up to me before and say, see this car, see this house. I believe for this, I did this. Well, it's true that we have to cooperate, but I can guarantee you, God is, it says in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth. God doesn't give you wealth directly, but he gives you power to get wealth, an anointing, an ability. And yes, you may have taken the word and you may have confessed and said, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that I receive when I pray and I've got this house, I've got this car, I've got my needs supplied. You may have done something, but faith doesn't make God do something. If God hadn't already provided prosperity for you, you can't make it happen. And likewise, you know, if you want to be, you know, like you want to live in a $10 million house, I'm not saying that there's a limit on God. God can do anything. But, but you know, I don't desire a $10 million house. 
if I had something that big, I wouldn't even want to clean the thing. I wouldn't want to take care of it. I don't have any desire for that. I don't believe that that's God's will. Now, I believe that God can do it. That's not a problem. But I don't believe that God wants me to just live in this opulence and take all of the blessing and use it on myself. I believe that the reason God has given me the power to get wealth is so that he can establish his covenant here on the earth. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good. And why do you do this? That you may have to give to him that needs. The real reason for prosperity isn't so you can just get all you can and then can all you get and then sit on your can. That is not the purpose for prosperity. Prosperity empowers you to not only take care of yourself and your family, but it empowers you to be a blessing. You know, we give away, I don't even know, we quit counting at hundreds of millions of books, CDs, and DVDs I've given away. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, hundreds of millions. And then if you add to that, our website where we have over a million downloads of free product. We got 200,000 hours of free material on our website. If you were to add that, I don't even know, but it's definitely hundreds of millions of free teachings and things that we have given. And you know what? That's why God prospered me is so that I can put out the gospel. And as I'm doing this, one hand to receive from God and one hand to give and to share these truths with others. But as the money flows through, there's plenty for you. God just takes care of me as an afterthought. I am not seeking my own prosperity. I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then God just gives me these things. So I'm not preaching poverty. God, God doesn't mind you living in a nice house, but I'm saying that for you to sit there and use your faith to just confess for a bigger house, a bigger car, and all of this. I believe you are trying to make God do what you want to do, and you've got to put first the kingdom of God. Prosperity should come as a byproduct, as the fruit, and not the root of what you're believing for. So anyway, all of these things, see, fit together to me. God by grace has a perfect plan for my life and for your life. And so I don't use my faith to say, oh God, help me to be a, a, you know, a rocket scientist or help me to be a singer or help me to be a, a football player. Or, you know, I just go out and choose what I want and then I go to believing God to make it come to pass. That's frustrating. You will be frustrated to the max trying to force God to do something. But instead, what you do is by grace, you go and you say, Father, what is your will? What did you create me for? What is your plan for my life? What would you like me to do? And then once you understand what God's purpose for you is, well, then all of your gifts and all of your talents, all of your abilities, where you were born, whether you're male or female, anything about you, all of those things were determined by God to accomplish this grace that he had already planned for you before the world even began. And once you find out what that is, then faith just reach out and takes, receives what God has already provided. And I don't know about you, but this, this set me free. When I first got turned on to the Lord, I saw how bad our society was. We needed a revival. And I heard testimonies about people praying for revival. And so I started all night long revival prayer meetings. Of course, they never went all night long. I think the longest we ever lasted was about one o'clock in the morning and everybody would go home. And finally, I was left there by myself and I'd just go home myself. And, but we would try and pray and we would grab hold of the horns of the altar and we wouldn't let it go. We were saying, oh God, we command you to move. I actually found myself praying one time and pleading with God so strong to send revival that I actually said this out of my mouth. I said, oh God, if you love the people in Arlington, Texas, half as much as I did, you, we would have revival. And as soon as I said that, I knew something had to be wrong with this. I was claiming that I loved people more than God did. 
And it just dawned on me that I was starting from this position that God is up there in heaven with his arms folded saying, nope, you guys have sinned too much. You're going to have to beg more. You're going to have to get a million more people to pray. You got to put more pressure on me that God was kind of resisting and not wanting to give revival. And as I've grown in the Lord, I've come to realize that God wants to see people's lives change more than you and I do. We don't have to plead. No, God, pour out your spirit. You know, I think it's Isaiah chapter 64. It says, rend the heavens and come down. And I've heard people pray that exact prayer. But what's wrong with that is that in the new covenant, God rent the heavens and came down. And through Jesus, we now have a freedom and access to God that the Old Testament saints didn't. And for us to go and plead and, and command God to move and, oh, God, go touch this person. It's starting from a position to where you don't believe in God. The right way to pray is to just say, Father, thank you that you love this person more than I do. You love this city. You love this nation more than I do. You aren't willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, Second Peter chapter 3. So, Father, I thank you that you want to move in this nation. So here am I. Use me. And then if you're praying for a certain individual, Father, I know you won't force yourself upon them, but I know that you love them. You're wanting to heal them, deliver them, set them free. The problem isn't with you. The problem is with them. Somebody has to invite you. And so I'm just inviting you. I'm giving you freedom. You can flow through me to reach out to this person. And see, if you pray that way, it takes all of the struggle out of it. Before I was pleading with God, and I tell you, I was worn out. I was trying to stay up all night long and pray, and it was frustrating. Now, I just, I enter into the rest of the Lord. I say, Father, you've already provided it. God, if I need healing, I don't need you to heal me. You've already put that healing power in me, and I'm just releasing it. You said it's voice activated, Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So I'm going to start speaking words that by your stripes, I am healed. You told me to speak to the mountain. And so I speak to this mountain, sickness, cancer, whatever it is. I speak to you. I speak death to you. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I speak death to this sickness right now. And now, body, I speak life unto you. You speak life into your situation. But see, it takes the burden off of your shoulders. There's some Christians that just, it's like everything depends on them. They've got a prayer chain. They got a prayer list. Every day they have to go through this and they got to do everything just right. That'll wear you out. This is why so many people fall away from the Lord because they just can't maintain that long term. You have to enter into the rest, but it's not a rest where you're just asleep and doing nothing. It says in Hebrews chapter four, I believe it's verse 11, labor to enter into this rest. The hardest thing you will ever do is get to where you just say, Father, I believe that you've already provided this. I believe that I've already been healed. First Peter 2, 24, this healing is in my body. I can't see it. I can't feel it. The doctor says I'm dying, but I am not going to get into care. I'm not going to get into fear. I am laboring to rest. And so you get into the word, you go to praying, you listen to praise music, you get around people that speak faith. It takes effort to rest in the fact that God has already provided everything. I tell you, that's powerful. You know, I've gone through this relatively quickly. I've got an entire series entitled Living in the Balance of Grace and Faith. And I've also got a book on that. If you go to our website, you could get that book and there's just a lot more, but what I've shared with you today is really just foundational stuff that God has already provided everything you will ever need. Not only what you need right now, but anything you will ever come up against in your life, you don't have to ask God to do it for you. You just have to rest in the fact that he's done it and learn how to receive, and that's by faith. Faith receives what God has already provided by grace. It doesn't make him move. It's not up to you to twist God's arm and make him release his blessing into your life. He loves you more than you love yourself. 
It says in Isaiah, or excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think toward as the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God loves you and his plans for you are only good plans. And he's already provided everything. If you are born again, you already have everything on the inside of you that you will ever need. You don't need God to give you more. What you've got to do is renew your mind and learn how to receive what God has already provided. That's the balance between grace, God's part, and faith, your part. And if you get out of balance in this area, uh, you're either going to, grace will cause you to just live in sin because you, you just, after all, it's up to God. I don't have to live holy. I don't have to keep my mind on the Lord. Or if you get too much into faith, it'll make you legalistic where you've got to earn everything and live holy enough. It's neither of these. It's the combination of the two. You know, the last thing before I turn it right back over to Pastor Andrew, there's an example of, you know, sodium and chloride are both poisons. And if you ingest enough of sodium by itself or chloride by itself, it'll kill you. But if you mix them together, it becomes salt and you'll die without it. Did you know that grace alone will kill you? Faith alone will kill you. But you put faith in what God has already done by grace. And that is the recipe for an abundant life. So, man, I hope that helps you the way it's helped me. So, Again, Pastor Andrew, I sure appreciate you letting me come and share with your people and hope that I don't let Thank you, Andrew. That was just phenomenal. Great teaching. We really appreciate that. And now we've just got a few questions that we see how many we can get through. We've had lots of questions come through uh, via YouTube and Facebook. And so the first question, Andrew, is from Adam. And he writes, what is the difference, Andrew, between faith and positive thinking? I think that faith involves positive thinking. For instance, if you're constantly thinking negatively, well, then that's not faith, that's unbelief. But you could, you could get into positive thinking. A person that doesn't even know Jesus could sit here and just think that if I, you know, there's power in my mind. The power isn't in your mind. The power is in your born again spirit, but it has to flow through your mind to get to your body. So if you just, emphasize positive thinking, you're drawing on the soulish realm. Christians should be drawing out of the spirit realm. The soulish realm is powerful, but it has limitations and you will eventually fail. If you really want to see the supernatural power of God, you got to operate out of the spirit, which involves positive thinking, but that's not where the power comes from. That's a great answer. Thank you for that. Now, someone writes from YouTube, uh, asking about the role of fasting with prayer and healing. Can you just talk a little bit about that, Andrew? Yeah, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 21, that scripture says, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And this is where the disciples tried to cast the demon out of a demon-possessed boy, and they couldn't do it. And Jesus said, it's your unbelief that's the problem, but this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And people take that and think, well, there's certain demons then that you have to pray and fast uh, to get them out. But that's not what it's talking about. The subject of the 20th verse, it was uh, unbelief. And it's saying this kind of unbelief only goes out through prayer and fasting. You will never encounter a demon that the name of Jesus and faith in his name isn't enough. And you've got to add to it your fasting and prayer. But fasting and prayer will affect your hard heart it will make you more sensitive to God if you do it correctly. Again, fasting is one of those things that's a religious deal, and many people do fasting as something that puts pressure on God. They think, he won't answer my prayer just straight up, but maybe if I go to fasting and I'm so hungry and I'm wasting away, that'll play on his mercy, and then he'll finally give in to me. No, that's not what it does. Fasting and prayer gets rid of your unbelief, and then the simple name of Jesus and faith in his name will deal with any problem you got. Oh, that was great. Thank you so much. Now, Clubby writes, how do you personally cultivate and walk out your daily supernatural life? Are there some keys you'd like to share there, Andrew? Well, i tell you one other thing. I was thinking about this today. I used to spend hours, one or two hours a day, just praying. 
And I would really focus on that and pray. And did you know, uh, I've now been walking with the Lord for 52 years. And I went walking for, for an hour and a half today. And during that hour and a half, I was praying most of the time. I was praying in tongues. I was asking God for things. So I still spend some time just speaking out. But my prayer life now has changed to where the vast majority of it is just keeping my mind stayed upon God. In Psalms chapter 5, he's talking about, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. And he there says meditation is prayer. So over the years, I've come to a place where, honestly, I, I used to spend at least two or three hours a day just praying out loud uh, to God. Now, I don't, I don't do that that much. Again, sometimes like today I probably spend an hour just praying and, and stuff, but m there are some days that I may not spend more than 10 minutes in uh, prayer just, you know, with my eyes closed, talking directly to God. The vast majority of the time I'm just keeping my mind stayed upon God. I'm meditating on Scripture. I'm, I'm telling God that I love Him and just worshiping Him. You know, I believe that Adam and Eve, they, they spent time with God every day in the cool of the evening. And what were they doing? They didn't have any demons to cast out. They didn't have any clothes to believe for. They didn't have cars to believe for, houses to believe for. There was nothing to ask for, and there was no one to intercede for. So what did they do? What was their prayer like? I believe it was just, you know, like God, today was awesome. Temperature was beautiful. Sunrise, sunset was great. I saw animals today that I'd never seen before. I'd tasted for, and it was just talking to God. Kind of like a parent, when your kid comes home, you don't necessarily have to have some kind of an essay where something of important is happening. You just ask them, how did your day go? And they tell you about what they did and the friends they played with. And a parent loves them so much, they just want to hear about everything that's going on. Hmm. So I, that's what my prayer life has become like. It's more just fellowship with God. And the, and the amazing thing is, Andrew, after you live that way, you don't have to ask for very much. Because when you keep your mind stayed on the Lord, when you put first the kingdom of God, all of these other things just are added unto you supernaturally. So I spend very little time asking for anything. That's great. That's a great answer. I love that. Now, another one, Andrew. Virginia writes, can you give us a specific example of how you pray for healing? And do you have a, a testimony that you could share relating to that that would be encouraging for people today? Man, I've got millions of testimonies. I've, I've prayed for so many people. We've seen people raised from the dead. If people would go to our website, they could see 33 testimonies that my media department has put together of people that have been miraculously healed. Uh, one of them was raised from the dead. People healed of multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, and uh, just anything and everything. Uh, let me say this, Andrew, that uh, I had a situation, I think it was in, uh, 2009 and I was out golfing and I didn't put any sunscreen on and I got really sunburned and I had this big old blister oh. come up on my ear matter of fact if it was seven years ago I bet you I had it when I was at you, your place you did I, I remember I saw that and I had this blister come up on my ear and it was kind of like a blood blister and I just got tired of looking at it so I ripped the thing off I just tore it <laughs> off and figured it would heal and it didn't heal and it went six years and that thing got worse and it spread and uh, it was bleeding and I never went to a doctor but I have a doctor who's on my board and every year when he'd come to our board meeting he'd get me off to the side and he'd say this is a melanoma you got cancer mm. now again I never had it diagnosed but you know I just believe that God had already provided it and I spoke to it and I let it go. And actually, I believe that probably I stretched it out longer than it had to go because I didn't ever have to look at my ear. <laughs> you know, when you're fixing your hair or shaving or something like that, I don't really look at my ear. So I just kind of ignored it. But other people, man, it really bothered them. And anyway, after six years, it just left. And today, I'm totally healed of this. Now, I don't believe that it was God's will that it goes six years. It took me six years. But you know what I did? I, I didn't 
keep asking God over and over and over to heal me. I started thanking God that he had healed it. I spoke to it. The Bible says, speak to your mountain. I prayed in tongues. I asked God for wisdom. But you know what? I honestly cast my care about it over on the Lord. And praise God. Today, I have no problem whatsoever. That's so that's the way I dealt with that. That's great because there's quite a number of questions that ask about what you do while you're waiting for your miracle. You've prayed, you've spoken to your condition, but there, might, there may be a number of years that have passed before uh, you get your miracle and what you do while you're waiting. And I think you've answered that really well. Yeah, and you know, this is really where the battle is. The battle is in the mind. It, it doesn't take much to heal. God, there's nothing hard for God. The problem is our fear and unbelief. And you've got to guard your heart. And with me, that's exactly what I mean. There, I'd get around people. I remember being in Charlotte, North Carolina, and in one service, I had two people come up that had the exact same thing that I had on my ear. And one of them had had his whole ear amputated. And the other one had half of his ear cut off. And they came up and asked me to pray for him. <laughs> and I was laying hands on them while at the same time I had that. And it was like, this is where it's going if you don't do something. And I had to guard my heart and say, I don't know why it went that way with them, but I know that I'm healed and I'm not losing my ear. And I had to just guard my heart and fight over that. So that's what people, that's the real battle. It's the battles in the mind. Yeah, that's great. And I guess that leads on to this next question uh, by Amy. What can we practically do to protect our imagination every day? Well, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. And Andrew, that word for mind right there is the Hebrew word Y-E-S-T-E-R, and, and it literally means conception. And that exact same Hebrew word that was translated mind in Isaiah 26, 3 was translated imagination four or five other times in Scripture. So when it's talking about he'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him, you have to keep your imagination stayed upon him. And your imagination, you know, I've got a whole teaching on this, a, a book on it. But your imagination is your ability to see something with your heart that you can't see with your eyes. And the way you do that is through the Word of God. When you study the Word of God, the Word of God will paint a picture on the inside of you. And let me just share this one other thing. In uh, Psalms chapter 1, verse 2, it says, In his law doth he meditate day and night. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Did you know the exact same Hebrew word that was translated meditate in Psalms 1-2 was translated imagine in Psalms 2-1? So your imagination is a part of meditation. Many people just read a scripture like, by his stripes, you are healed. And they get the information, yeah. but they don't meditate on it until they see themselves healed. And this is what you've got to do. And this is how you keep your mind stayed on the Lord. You take scripture and you don't just read it, but you see it. If it says, by his stripes, you are healed, you see yourself healed. And yet many people, when the doctor tells them you're gonna die, they actually see themselves dying. They will think about their funeral. They'll wonder what songs are they gonna sing at my funeral? How are they gonna take care of my kids? Will anybody miss me? See, that's that's a negative yeah, imagination. Yeah, worry. Yeah. You need to focus on, no, I'm gonna be well and see yeah. yourself well and see yourself giving a testimony, things like that. That's great. And maybe just a couple more, if you've got time. Dean writes, sure. how do you approach hearing God for direction in your life? through the Word of God. The Word of God, I'd say 90-something percent of everything God has ever told me came through Scripture. And, you know, it may not be like a Scripture that says you go buy this house or do something like that, but He will give me principles from the Word of God and show me things. And then there are some things that have to be very specific uh, and it, it's not going to be found in Scripture. And one of the ways I do that is uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says when you pray in an unknown tongue, 
your spirit is praying. The spirit is a part of you that has the mind of Christ. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, if you pray in tongues, pray also that you interpret. So sometimes when I need a really specific answer, that instead of just principles that I guide my life by, then I'll pray in tongues and ask for an interpretation. And I mean, God just supernaturally brings things back to my remembrance. And that's how he speaks to me. There was a time that I was building a building and I'd tried for nine months to get a loan and I couldn't do it. And finally they said, let's just start the whole process over. And I said, man, all I could see was another nine months of nothing working. And I said, what's, what's wrong? And so I started walking and I prayed and I said, Father, my spirit knows all things. First John 2, 20. And when I'm praying in tongues, my spirit is praying and I'm praying the hidden wisdom of God. So I'm going to speak in tongues and speak the answer out of my mouth and I ask you to interpret it. And within two or three minutes, I mean, boom, like that. God brought a prophecy back to me that I had gotten two years before that I had forgotten and neglected and it was my answer. And I mean, immediately we saw things change. That's fantastic. That's how God speaks to me. And just one last question, and this is actually for me. And uh, okay. one of the things, that stands out about your ministry is your ability to memorize and quote scripture. I, I've watched you for many years do that. And it seems like you've got this well inside you. And I'd like to know how you've practically gone about memorizing scripture and how you approach reading the word. Have you got any keys there that you can share with people about approaching the word and memorizing the word? I never memorize the scripture. I never try and memorize the scripture. What I do is I just take the word and I read it for me. And then when God speaks something to me, I live it. It becomes a part of me. And, you know, it's like at my wedding. Uh, you could say, what was your wedding like? And I don't have to say, well, let me go back and think about it and look it up and pray. Right. I was there. It's a part of me. And I could tell you everything about my wedding, even though it's been now 48 years ago. And it's the same thing. The Word of God, some people go and try and memorize it, which I'm not against that. But if all you do is store the information here and it isn't on your heart level, it's not going to change your life. So all I do is, like I studied the Word probably two or three hours this morning. And I was studying about Uzziah and about Ahaz and the things that happened to them. And I read the whole book of Micah today. And God just spoke some things to me. And so what I'll do is after I get this information, I'll go walking or praying and I'll think about it and say, God, how does this apply to me? And then he'll speak something specifically to me. And once it enters into my heart, I don't ever have to try and memorize it. It just became a part of me. That's a great answer. And finally, just one more, if you've got time. If, sure. if you could recommend one book that you've written to people, what book would you recommend and why? I'd probably recommend Spirit, Soul, and Body. That is, to me, the most foundational thing that God ever spoke to me. And some of the things I talked about today kind of uh, are close to that teaching. But uh, that's what changed my life. It's like somebody stuck a key in my brain and unlocked my brain when I understood that I was a spirit that had a soul and lived in a body, but the real me is a spirit and it was completely changed to salvation. So I've got a book entitled Spirit, Soul, and Body. It's really good. Fantastic. So just before you leave, Andrew, would you do us the honor of praying for us, our church, and all those watching online just before I hand it back to Keith? So, Father, I just thank you. I thank you for Pastor Andrew and the church there. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you that you love the people in Australia and Melbourne more, Father, than any of us do. And you want to use us, that you have already provided not only forgiveness of sins, but healing, deliverance, peace, prosperity, everything that those people need. And, Father, you just need someone to proclaim it. I pray for Pastor Andrew and his church, and I'm believing, Father, that the things I've shared here and, of course, other things that Andrew and the other ministers share, Father, I just thank you that the Word of God is burning in people's hearts, that they'll go out and share these truths with other people, and we believe that these truths will set them free. 
So I'm asking you for increased opportunities. I pray blessings over that church, over every individual member, that even during the quarantine, that they are gonna prosper, that you are supplying their need according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And we thank you for healing. We speak healing. We know that you've already provided it and we access it by faith and say that, Father, no plague is coming nigh our dwelling. I pray for them. I just thank you that spirit, soul, and body, the individuals and the church are prospering and making a difference that, Father, many people are coming into the kingdom. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. You've been from afar a mentor for me and we just want to honor you for your ministry and we just so value that and we appreciate the time that you've invested in our lives and from all the way over in Australia we say may God bless you and favor you and may increase be your portion in Jesus name thank you Pastor Andrew you are a blessing love you thank you